Hi, hello, and welcome to the show. Today, I want to talk to you about Liz Taylor, one of the biggest stars that we had in old Hollywood. And she has quite an interesting life, I must say. So her life and fame had a lot to do with Victor Cazalet. Who is this person? When I was researching Liz Taylor, he was the one I researched about the most, I think, because he was so intriguing and fascinating to me. And he was part of the so-called Clamor Boys, which is a great name, I think. And they were nicknamed by that by Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. The Clamor Boys were a group of homosexual British members of Parliament in the 1930s. And they were also among the first to warn about Hitler. Victor came from a wealthy family and Queen Victoria was not only a frequent guest at their French estate, but also Victor's godmother. He was an influential and successful politician and was friends with Churchill and Eden and even godfather to Mary Churchill, Churchill's daughter. So he is really like an impressive British figure. His friendship with Liz Taylor's family has the following background. Liz's father moved his family to London to run a fine art gallery there. And Victor Casale, who was interested in the fine arts, befriended them. They were all Christian scientists, which is a faith, and they spent many a week together at Casale's summer estate, where Liz Taylor actually learned riding and even got a horse of her own there, which was called Betty. And Victor became her godfather, and he would be the one person Liz called for when being sick. He would be one of the greatest influences of her life. And when he felt the war approaching, he sent the Taylors back to America and they settled in Los Angeles. Casalette wrote to his friend Hedda Hopper, who was an influential Hollywood journalist, to introduce the Taylors. And Hopper endorsed the new gallery of Liz Taylor's father in Beverly Hills. And soon a lot of clients from the movie industry would gather there. And through a client connection made through this, Liz Taylor got a contract offer as an actress both from Universal Pictures and Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Liz and her parents chose Universal, and this is how the rise of the star that Liz Taylor would become began. So, this person, this Victor Casale, who is like a very interesting person in and of himself, was like the beginning. He introduced them to Hada Hopper, who I will come on in a later episode, and this made it possible for Liz to be introduced to where she went. So I think this is fascinating. So the first steps in Hollywood. Liz Taylor actually just had one movie made with Universal because the casting director, a woman, didn't like her. She said that Liz had too sophisticated and too adult a face and did not fit the child star mold that was hyped by such actresses like Shirley Temple or Julie Garland. So her contract uh, was terminated. So Liz tried with MGM in 1942 and got a role in Lassie Come Home, which actually resulted in a seven-year contract. And her most exciting role would be National Velvet, where she was cast based on her English accent and her excellent writing skills. Because the production company had been looking for a girl just like her for many, many years. And they actually waited for another few months for Liz to crew a little bit more to be able to pull off the role. So during this time that she waited to crow a little bit, Liz perfected her riding and she got braces to crack her teeth. Fortunately, Liz and her parents refused to have her hair dyed, her eyebrows corrected or her name changed. Otherwise, we would not know the Liz Taylor that we do now. So when National Velvet was released, it was a huge success and it catapulted the beautiful young Liz into immediate stardom. For Liz Taylor, though, that meant the end of her childhood, as she was now an MGM star, and MGM started to control every aspect of her life. Because as I said in an earlier episode, like the 
movie industry, the studio system, meant you were owned by the studio and they even ruled your private life. <laughs> so Liz made commercially successful movies. She transitioned to teen roles and finally to more mature roles when she turned 19 in 1950. Her big breakthrough came with Father of the Bride. During the publicity campaign for the movie, then 18-year-old Taylor married the hotel chain heir Conrad Hilton Jr., which is the grandfather of Paris Hilton, who we all know. And MGM picked up the check for the lavish ceremony. It was like wildly publicized. And also her subsequent movies were big successes with A Place in the Sun establishing her as a dramatic actress. And although she was a megastar already at MGM, she was cast for an MGM B movie as a punishment when she was divorcing Hilton, which I find kind of funny. She divorced him after eight months. And after the lavish wedding, after, you know, all the publicity, it was really like a little bit of a shitstorm which was going on in the press. And MGM was really sour about it. So this kind of scandal punished her back to the B movies. But after that, with Ivano, which was filmed in the UK, I think, Liz started another string of really successful movies after that. So the punishment didn't really sting. Her real stardom, though, started with the 1950s, when American cinema was facing TV as a real rival. And the movies and roles got more demanding and had a higher quality, which really played into Liz Taylor's cards. It was Giants that she starred in, opposite Rock Hudson and James Dean, and it became her breakthrough as a star. After that was Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and it is probably one of the most successful and noted and celebrated movies of Liz Taylor, and I personally love it. But the backstory is just as interesting as the movie. It was just two weeks into filming that Liz's husband's third husband, Mike Todd, died in a plane crash, and she had to continue with the movie nevertheless, and she basically became Maggie, she said in an interview later. And in post-production, she started an affair with Eddie Fisher, then husband of Debbie Reynolds, who, you know, they were the original American sweethearts. They were like match made in heaven. And the American public really saw Liz as a homewrecker. So Liz's image changed from successful teen star turned mega star to widow to homewrecker within a really short time span. And MGM was really clever. They used that to its advantage and they put Liz on a movie poster and just a white slip dress on a bed, just alluding to their home record status. So much PR know-how, right? It was Butter Eight Field which followed along that kind of, you know, sexualized role that put her into that siren theme. And um, it was like a good strategy because it earned Liz Taylor an Academy Award. Although Liz herself was not happy with the role. She didn't like to be a call girl and she just did it because she was on a contract. And then, of course, followed Cleopatra. What would Liz Taylor be without Cleopatra? It made Taylor more famous than anything she did before that. But mostly because the movie almost ruined Fox, the studio producing it, because it was the most expensive movie made up until then. With costly costumes, long breaks due to Taylor's ill health and the extramarital affair she conducted with co-star Richard Burton. It is a huge story. You should read up on the movie. I can't recount everything that went on. Subsequently, Taylor and Burton got married and they made several movies together that basically mirrored their own lives. And it led them to Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. It's the best work as an actress that Liz Taylor ever gave and it earned her another Academy Award. And it made her the star that we know because up until then it was almost thought of that she never really acted, that she was kind of just herself and, you know, just speaking words. But that role really was demanding. She had to portray a woman way older than herself. She really had to go deep in her emotions. And if you watch it, it is worth a watch. It is like deeply disturbing in a way and it's dark but it's worth a watch and you can really understand the genius and the creativity and the performing star Elizabeth Taylor was. You can really see that spark in her. 
But the films after that could not reach the height of success that she once had. And slowly the parts were dying out. So she got involved in her new husband's political campaign. He was a politician and she had to relocate to Washington as a politician's wife. And then and there, Liz Taylor got highly depressed. She gained a lot of weight, which eventually led to her diet book. And she developed addictions to several substances, one of them being alcohol, others being subscription drugs. Soon, she and her husband, the politician, split. And after dating several men, she met her last husband at the Betty Ford Center. It was construction worker Larry Fortensky. And I can remember that vividly because... You know, I lived back then. <laughs> it was during my lifetime this all happened. And I was reading like those gossipy magazines back then. And I was like, oh no, how could she? I mean, she was like Hollywood royalty and he was like just, you know, some worker. So it was like really a scandal. But they were married for five years only, but they remained friends for life. And they had like regular phone calls and they stayed in touch. So they really had a connection between the two. But what I find interesting about Taylor, apart from having this tumultuous life with eight different husbands, I mean, she married Richard Burton twice, but she was married eight times. But I think the most important activity or thing we should know about her was that she was an open advocate for HIV AIDS when her close friend Rock Hudson that she starred with in Giants revealed that he was dying from HIV AIDS. And she spent a lot of time, effort and money on the course. She was setting up the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation that would help expand AIDS AIDS and also expanding all the efforts into other countries and being internationally active. And she did a lot of work to make that disease a disease and not a stigma anymore. And we should really be thankful to her. And that is why Elizabeth Taylor really has a standing with the LGBTQ plus community because she was an early advocate of that and helping them. And she was also an active supporter of Jewish and Zionist causes and even converted to Judaism because, as she stated, I feel as I have been a Jew all my life. So, like, there were so much things going on. And there are lots of facts which I did not know about her. So I will just, you know, summarize them here. So a fun fact is that Liz Taylor wanted to play the leading part in What a Way to Go, which is one of my favorite movies. The role went to Shirley MacLaine instead, and I really would not be able to picture Taylor in it. Probably she would have been awesome, but I got to know and love the movie with Shirley MacLaine, and she was she's just irre irreplaceable in the movie to me. Liz Taylor earned more money with her 11 perfumes than throughout her whole acting career, and I totally believe that because, as I said before, when I was younger, I got to know all her perfumes. She was everywhere. She was basically every night when I was watching some, you know, kids program or something, it was always some advertisement for an Elizabeth Taylor perfume. So she was everywhere back then. And she had like a new scent every few months, it seemed. So I totally believe that. Liz Taylor is regarded as having had the most important private jewelry collection in the whole of America during her lifetime. She even published a book about them. And amongst the pieces that she owned, there were a lot of pieces from Bulgari, which was her favorite brand, apparently. And Burton, her twice husband, often purchased pieces there because he knew she loved them. But she also had pieces by other brands. And the most important piece of jewelry that Liz Taylor owned was the Elizabeth Taylor Diamond, which was formerly known as the Krupp Diamond. It belonged to the wife of an industrialist here in Germany, the Krupp family. They were really rich. And after her death, it was sold and Richard Burton purchased it and gifted it to Liz Taylor. It is one of the purest diamonds out there and one of the best known And it was the favorite piece of jewelry by Liz Taylor. And she just called it Baby Around the House. She had founded also a jewelry company, which was called House of Taylor, in collaboration with model Kathy Ireland and Czech and Monty Abramov. So also connections that I would have never made, like Kathy Ireland, Elizabeth Taylor, they seem like from two different planets to me, like two different eras which are being mixed. Then apparently Howard Hughes, like this impressive figure of old Hollywood, offered her parents a six-figure sum to marry her. I could not find out how old she was at that time, but I guess it was like after she 
turned to the more mature role. So probably she was like 17 or 18 or 19 around that time. But still, she was so beautiful. She was so impressive that he could have married anyone probably. But he offered money to do that, which I think is a fun fact. Elizabeth Taylor actually is one of the last stars of the Hollywood system, you know, that was shaped by the studio system and the Hollywood cinema back then. And one of the first, you know, viral celebrities with the rising of the paparazzi who are chasing the chat set life of the rich and famous. Taylor and Burton, those two together set the tone for how celebrities are still being chased in portrait. They are impacting influences until today, which I found extremely interesting. But Liz Taylor, which I did not know, had frail health. She had like really bad scoliosis, like the bending of your spine. She had a broken back from the filming of National Velvet and a near fatal bout of pneumonia. She was addicted to alcohol as well as painkillers and tranquilizers. And she was the first celebrity to openly admit herself to a clinic for treatment. And also she was a very heavy smoker until pneumonia. She had trouble with her weight, starting with a marriage to Senator Warner. And she even published a book, as I said before, about how to lose weight. But one of her most extraordinary features were her eyes. They were blue, but they were so blue that they appeared violet and they were rimmed by dark double eyelashes, which were caused by genetic mutation, which I also think is a fun fact, which I didn't know. And as I've said before, she was married eight times to the grandfather of Paris Hilton and twice to Richard Burton. So that really like is a tumultuous life. And I got some learnings from that because she was married the first time when she was 18. She was brought up very puritanically, which led her to believe that marriage and love are one and the same. This marriage was divorced rather soon because there was not love between the two. She just got the two confused. And I think this early set of belief that marriage and love are the same probably accounts why she married eight times. Because, you know, beliefs implemented in childhood are really hard to overcome. And I also think that our teen years are the most forming years we can have. We develop our individuality. We develop who we are and who we can be as adults. And Liz Taylor herself claims that or claimed that her childhood ended very early when MGM started controlling her life. And she was deprived of the years of trying things, of failing, you know, of finding one's own footing in life. And of finding out who she was. I mean, Elizabeth Taylor could never find that out because MGM told her who she was supposed to be. I guess she acted that out in her private life. She was chasing who she could be. That might explain some of the up and downs in her life. But I truly admire her for her ferocity and her energy. Someone wrote about her that she was a pre-feminist woman through which we can get a sense of her deep animalistic power that, you know, a woman like Helena of Troy must have had because, you know, kingdoms were destroyed because of her. And I think that really sums up why she was so absolutely fascinating and mesmerizing. And that makes her really a star of Hollywood because these personalities and characters are really, really hard to find these days. So this was like a really short glimpse into the life that Elizabeth Taylor had. And I really encourage you to look her up because her story is just too great to not read about. I will talk to you next week. Bye.